Uh, our guest in this segment is Gene Bruskin, the author of The Return of John Brown, a new musical. And this is being staged around the metropolitan area. They're doing a show in Baltimore, April the 26th, Washington, D.C., April the 27th. And then at the John Brown Raid headquarters in Maryland on May 4 and May 5. Gene, good morning. Thank you for joining us. You're on with Rob and John. Rob and John, it's a pleasure to meet both of you, and thanks for having me on. Absolutely. Where are you physically located right now, Gene? I'm in Silver Spring, Maryland, uh, just sort of north of uh, Washington, D.C. Yes, I was, I've been a Montgomery Re County resident in my time, and, and, and John emigrated here from Fairfax County not too long ago. Okay. Uh, Gene, tell me the uh, interest and fascination with the John Brown Raid as the genesis of this musical. Uh, so, uh, I've always sort of been uh, curious and interested in uh, in John Brown. He's this legendary abolitionist, historical figure, but also very controversial. Uh, you know, was this guy a good guy? Was he a madman? Was he a terrorist? And uh, for people who don't know, and I'm finding out in the process of, of producing this musical, that uh, many people, since me most of us didn't get too much history in our high school or even in college, most people don't know who John Brown was. But Brown was a, a, uh, born around 1800, and he became increasingly interested in his lifetime in uh, trying to do something to end slavery. Uh, and uh, during the in the mid fifties, he went out to Kansas. He's from the eastern uh, part of the country, uh, and became part of the the wars out there uh, about how to trying to stop oh, uh, Kansas from becoming a slave state. Uh, by 1859, he had decided to launch a raid in Harper's Ferry, which was a, a big armory there, seize the weapons, and free uh, the uh, uh, hand them out to slaves and the, throughout the South and start an insurrection. That failed. Uh, it was a little bit, you know, uh, more than anybody was capable of, but it started a transformational moment, both because it scared all the Southern slave owners that something was going to happen, and in the North, it brought the issue of slavery to the front page of every newspaper, really all over the country, uh, when John Brown made some eloquent statements right before he was hanged in Charlestown, uh, Virginia. And he said that, uh, that the evils of slavery will never be dealt with peacefully. And people thought that was sort of extreme at the moment. But, of course, a couple of years later, when the South withdrew and Abraham Lincoln uh, in launched the, the reaction and the Civil War began, 700,000 people, north and south, although more from the south, died in that war. So Brown was a prophetic figure, a little understood, and this is a story of him in the past a little bit, but then it, it magically he reemerges right where he was hanged in Charlestown in the present. And he gets arrested again by a local sheriff who thinks he's going to stir up trouble, and they put him on trial. And so the story takes place in the present, uh, and it's a musical, it's a comedy, but it's got a bunch of history in. Uh, so uh, we think it's a lot of fun, and it's really something that uh, you can learn from and enjoy at the same time. By the way, uh, tomorrow is uh, the 1861, April 12, the Battle of Fort Sumter as the uh, Civil War officially began with Confederate forces firing on Fort Sumter. And as you pointed out, there is a link from John Brown to Fort Sumter in the start of the Civil War, Gene. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, the uh, uh, although Brown was not that well known, he was known in a lot of circles uh, before the 1859 raid. Once that raid happened, he became a seminal figure in history uh, and was... Like, there's a song which many people might have known. It late, later was changed into uh, uh, other words, but it's basically John Brown's body lies a moldering in his grave, but his truth keeps marching on. And there, there's a whole song that the Union soldiers sang when they, uh, when they marched 
Uh, and uh, so it, it's it's part of like taking a look at our history as a way to think at the about the present. And for people who are interested, it's free. Uh, we're particularly excited at the two performances on the fourth and fifth in Sharpsburg, Maryland, right at the historic. Uh, Ken, what's not what is named the Kennedy Farm? That was just the, who owned it at the time, where John Brown and his his people stayed when they staged the raid, and that uh, is a national historic site which hasn't been open for a few years. There's going to be a tour there at 11:30, and then at one o'clock the show starts. So if people go to the website, the Return of John Brown dot com. You can make a reservation. It's free. You can come and get a tour uh, that few people have seen in recent years, and you can enjoy this musical followed by discussion at the afternoon of May 4th and 5th outdoors with the cabin in the background. There have been a lot of uh, stories written, books, and, and even uh, we, I think there was a play within the last year here uh, locally in Jefferson County about the trial of John Brown, but I've not uh-huh. heard anything regarding a musical relating to John Brown. Why a musical, Gene? <laughs> well, uh, actually, you know, I'm not a uh, what you would call a professional playwright. I, I really uh, spent my life as a union organizer, and I retired uh, at the end of 2012. And since then, uh, maybe this is because of when I grew up in my house where we had a lot of musicals, My Fair Lady and Fiddler on the Roof and all the popular musicals of that era on all the time. Uh, I got involved. Uh, I'd written a couple musicals, uh, and I found that I'm very interested in sort of using uh, musical theater as a way to help uh, teach people some history while they're being entertained and maybe inspired. And I found that people could uh, enjoy and learn at the same time because uh, so much that we don't know from our history classes. And then following the musical, we have a conversation and people get to give some feedback about what they liked about the show uh, and, and also get to ask some questions and make some comments. Uh, in this case, this is what is called a staged reading where there's going to be actors they're rehearsed, they're singers, uh, so it, it's, on the one hand, it's like, a, like an actual musical, but it's, uh, it's not going to be fully staged with scenery and all the choreography. We're at a stage just before we're, uh, we're looking to make a fully produced show. And actually, we hope some theater people will come who might want to uh, follow this up and produce a play of their own uh, somewhere Maybe in Martin, uh, in uh, Martinsburg or, or anywhere in that area. Hey, Gene, this is John Gilstrap. Good morning. Uh, I'm Hi, cu- John. I'm curious about the, the decision, the, the reset into the modern day. That, that kind of confused me. Uh, first of all, why that, why that choice? And in the, in, within the plot itself, you say he, he reemerges into the modern day and, and then he's arrested. Kind of on what charge? Talk me through that, the decision itself and then the, the plot point. <clears throat> well, the, <clears throat> um, I, I felt like that a lot of people, uh, there's been, I, I, I think as was mentioned, there's been many books, articles, you know, uh, historical websites and so on about John Brown's history. Uh, but uh, uh, I, and so I begin the play the opening is the hanging of John Brown and his final words. Uh, and so I, I sort of give people a, a glimmer of that history. But then I take it into the present because I'm more interested in what John Brown had to say, uh, how it applies to our present moment, than I am the detailed history which uh, other people have written about. But once the present uh, once the play proceeds and he goes on trial, uh, they threaten to hang him again. And the trial becomes an argument that's both historical, what did he do and why did he do it, and whether any of the issues uh, uh, of racism and the divisions between black and white people uh, that he fought against then in the form of slavery are still relevant today. So, so is- I flip the past and the present uh 
together. And on your last question, or the other part of your question, uh, he's arrested be, because uh, a local farmer, a farmer and a sheriff see this guy who has mysteriously crawled out of his grave, and uh, he looks like John Brown. He's carrying a rifle from 1859, uh, and he introduces himself to some of the local farmers uh, trying to find his way. And so he says he's John Brown. He looks like John Brown, but he can't possibly be John Brown because he'd be like Rip Van Winkle, right? So there's there's a lot of uh, it's there's a little bit of a comic aspect, but you know there's a fear that John Brown running around with his rifle, he is he a violent guy who's going to stir up the troops, you know, and and create conflict, and so they decide to arrest him and charge him with, uh, you know, resisting arrest, or they they have a big argument about what to charge him with, and so the trial becomes a discussion of who he is and what he's done and what it means today, and. And it's set in 2024? It's set in 2024. Wow, I wish Matt Harvey were here. He would have been prosecuting this. <laughs> That's true. He would be, Matt Harvey's the Jefferson County yeah, prosecuting yeah. attorney. He would be prosecuting John Brown. That's yeah, right. There you go. There you go. So that, And there's a plot twist uh, into the present where John Brown gets involved in some of the sort of current issues and uh, with some of the local farmers, and they help him in the end, uh, escape. And uh, so there, there's a lot of history, a lot of presence, uh, a lot of drama, and a lot of fun uh, in, uh, in the show. And, uh, I, you know, I think it, it, it's a good combination, from my view, uh, of, of what theater can do to uh, entertain and even inspire people. What's the running time of the musical, Gene? Uh, the, well, you know, it's never, this would be the first time it's actually been staged. So it's a full-length, two-act musical. So it would be somewhere between an hour and a half and two hours. So what is going to happen at 1130 on May 4th and on May 5th, the uh, National Historical Site's going to be open for the first time in years for a free tour of the cabin. Uh, there are all these wax figures. There's all these historical monuments around. Uh, and then at 1 o'clock, uh, and there'll be some light refreshments, at 1 o'clock the musical is going to begin, uh, and then and it'll probably last an hour and a half, two hours, and then there's going to be some discussion. So uh, it's a nice afternoon out, and, uh, and uh, we're looking forward to some sunshine that day. Gene, this is not your first foray in uh, writing about race and racism in the 70s, you wrote a play called It's Not the Bus, a story about oh racism in Boston during busing. You did some research. <laughs> well, my, my co-host, John uh, Gilstrap, when he was a youth in Northern Virginia, was one of the folks at that time who was being bused uh, to school. So I, th uh -huh. I thought this uh -huh. might be an interesting perspective here. Tell me about that uh, yeah. play. Uh, well, I, I'll mention that play and also my last musical, which ended in 2020 in Baltimore, was about reconstruction mm -hmm. uh, and that ended because of covid and there's a film uh, which is available uh, it was called the moment was now but that also took on some of those issues so it's not the bus uh was uh took place i was living in boston at the time and driving a school bus you know that was my job uh and my job was to go uh, be, and for people who don't know, after years of unsuccessfully trying to desegregate Boston schools uh, by any other method, uh, there was finally a lawsuit. And in 1974, there was a guy named Judge Garrity mandated busing because it was it was it had been compulsory segregated, and he said it's got to be compulsory desegregated. So the remedy was to bus kids from the black neighborhoods to the white neighborhoods and vice versa. I was a driver. Uh, and so my job was to go into Roxbury, the black community, and drive kids into uh, South Boston, which was uh, about 98% white at the time, and they weren't very welcome. But we were stoned, uh, broken windows. There was a lot of violence, and that went on for years. While that was happening, there was a move by people in the black community 
in Boston to move into some neighborhoods uh, beyond the main black neighborhood, which is mostly Roxbury. When they did that, uh, there were attacks, sometimes all in the middle of the night by people, in, uh, mostly young kids in the neighborhood, throwing rocks through the window to try to drive them out. Uh, and so the issue became really the relationship in Boston between black and white people. It had really ultimately nothing to do with the bus. And so this is the story of this play called It's Not the Bus about uh, a black and white family uh, in a uh, mostly white neighborhood where the parents become friends of, the, of these two kids, a black and a white kid, uh, but the white kid is uh, involved in packing the black family's home. Uh, and so it's sort of a drama that is a chance to discuss the issues of race and what was going on in Boston which was a little bit like Birmingham, Alabama at that particular moment. John, you had the experience of being bust from the student's standpoint, not the bus driver's standpoint. I did. Uh -huh. and, and, and we were the in white kids. No, 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 no. In, in Northern oh, okay. Virginia. Um, we, okay. we were the white kids that were sh uh, shipped out to the black schools. And um, it was disruptive and it was violent. And it, it was not, not at all pleasant. Uh, and, uh, you know, that, that's kind of the, the end of the story. I don't. Uh, How long did it last, John? All of junior high, so it was seventh and eighth grade, and then um, and then we went back to our regular high school. It, it, it I don't know. And it was it was nineteen uh, sixty eight and sixty nine or sixty nine and seventy. I forget which. Uh -huh. So it pretty was pretty volatile years. Oh, it was terrible years. Um, and that was when DC was burning and you know all this stuff. So it was it was really it was a tough time, and there was a lot of stuff going on. We were the white kids in the white neighborhoods with, you know, it was all suburban. And it just, I was not aware of any of this stuff. You know, I was, I was it seemed, 12, it, 13 years old. Looking, and I just was not aware. Looking back on it, Gene and John, it seemed like an odd thing to put kids through. Yes. As, as they were kind of the pawns in the game that adults mm -hmm. were struggling with. Kids don't know any better. Yeah, I, it, it, it was. And as I mentioned, it really was not the best remedy. But what had happened is starting in the 50s and all through the 60s into the early 70s, there were many efforts to try to desegregate schools in the community. You had situations where white students, for example, were like three blocks from a school that had black students in it. But they would, they were, this is before the busing was mandated. They would be actually bust past that into an all white school. And the lines that were drawn in the city were ridiculous. They didn't make any sense. They were segregated. They were intentionally segregated. So after years of, of efforts of every kind, hundreds of meetings and demonstrations and so on, this lawsuit was filed. And so the remedy was in the end sort of extreme because of the, the uh, rigidity of the, the system to resist any normal form of integration had made it impossible. I don't think in the end uh, the, the busing worked either for the black community or the white community, uh, but it was, it was made necessary by, unfortunately, the resistance of the white community of being wanting to be in the same school with any black children. And I drove these kids and, uh, you know, they were like, hmm second grade or something, and they're going into a neighborhood, um, they had to have police escorts for 10 years. We would gather all the buses in a place called Columbia Point, which was just outside of South Boston. <clears throat> we would be surrounded by police cars and motorcycles and drive these kids to their schools. Some kids had their entire undergraduate, like elementary school, high school, etc., education under police escort. Uh, and that's not a way to, to grow up, you know. So I think things have been a little, have, have made some progress since then in, uh, in Boston, but it was a really tough time. I think, you know, it's just, that's an example, and we see this going on. I wouldn't go too far down this rabbit hole because we want to talk about your play, but I, we see over and over again, children are, are cute, and children make great political uh, pawns. And they they easily symbolize adult problems. 
that kids don't themselves don't understand. And, and my recollection of those times, and I was not aware of what I was feeling at the time. It's, it's all looking back. You know, we were just split up from our friends and because we we weren't all going there, just some were. And I'm sure that was that way for the kids you know, the, in Holmes Intermediate School is where I was going instead of Frost, which is where others I was supposed to go. And, I'm, and I'm, you know, everybody was just split up from their friends and it was uncomfortable and, and nobody was happy. And, and, and I guess somewhere politicians checked off a box and, and they were happy out of it. But anyway, I want to I yeah, get like back to... Like I said, to, it seems an odd thing to make kids pawns in that situation. It really does. Right. And I want right. to get back to the return of, of, of John Brown. So how, how um, is it largely a courtroom drama? Uh, no, well, no. First of all, it's a, it, it, the first courtroom is the one where he's hung. That's the way it opens. Uh, then there's a lot of courtroom scene, but also there is a lot of scenes that take place in John Brown's cell. Uh, the, the lawyers who come in to defend him uh, are the great-great-grandchildren of Harriet Tubman and Frederick Douglass, who, of course, were Maryland... Uh, 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 people originally, they hear that Brown has been arrested, uh, and in, in on behalf of their ancestors who were who were friends of Brown, they come down to defend him. So there's a lot of scenes in their cells with the uh, uh, with Brown and his lawyers, and then in the courtroom, uh, and uh, some sort of scenes outside of that. But that's primarily where it, uh, it takes place. Gene, great talking with you again today here. The uh, uh, Again, April 26th in Baltimore, April 27th in Washington, D.C., and nearby May 4 and 5 at the uh, John Brown Raid headquarters in Maryland near the Kennedy Farm there, and return of John Brown at gmail.com if you want to get in touch with our guest, yeah. Gene Bruskin. And also www.thereturnofjohnbrown.com. You can click there and get your RSVP, and it's free. Gene, great to talk with you, man. I, Thank I, you very, very much. interesting stuff. Good, good. Uh, yeah, I, good I hope to see both you guys there, and like to hear your comments after the show. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Gene. All right. Thank you. Bye, bye.